On peut laisser deux, trois minutes, ouais, parce que euh, on a quand même le représentateur. <coughs> J'aime ce que ça doit être. C'est des pères. Oh, c'est un peu le record de la boîte. Ça, ça tombe, ça tombe. Oui, écoute, je suis super content parce que euh, mon, mon, mon nouvel appui VPN, là, je ferme mon ordinateur, je passe sur un autre access point, je change de SSID, euh, il remonte tout seul. C'est bien ça. Euh, c'est super cool. Il n'y a pas grand monde. Ah, ouais, Samy, don't tell me. Right. Yeah, but we never reply by default. Yes, we do get the messages. <laughs> Uh, we, we give an update on the, the draft of our. Don't worry. But we'll have a call for the person. If, if our email address doesn't exist, you, you, re, you will receive an error by the email server. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I sent an email. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just uh, told us the same. Guys, this is, uh, we'll discuss that during the meeting. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, you guys, he's also complaining the same yeah, thing. Yeah, he's Yeah, complaining the same. Because I didn't get any Yes, he did. Uh, yeah, uh, Thomas replied to you. Huh? Thomas replied to you. Yeah, I need to check this one. Oh, I've seen that email. So I got right it. Right yeah. uh, Quite happy to hear. Uh, but uh, Thomas replied for you, uh, to your email. Yeah. This I know. Yeah. What did he say? What did you say? He said it's in the pipe or uh, uh, whatever. Week, last week, I guess. Right? I'll show it to you at the end of the meeting. <laughs> okay, people, uh, please be seated. Uh, this is the best working group session, and we are in Buenos Aires. Um, Patrice, take a seat. Stop discussing with your friends. Uh, so this is the note well please be aware that uh, your contribution to the IETF is subject to uh, IPR policies uh, the intent is not to go through the whole slide but uh, to raise your awareness that uh, policies exist and that you should review these so that you are fully aware of what you do and say. Uh, blue sheets. A anyone volunteering for uh, being a Java relay? Don't rush. Thanks okay, Adrian. thanks, Adrian. Uh, anyone volunteering to take minutes to complete uh, those that uh, Thomas and I will take? Okay. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Gunther? <laughs> yes, thanks. Uh, and you can always uh, type in some notes into the Etherpad, uh, the address of which is on the screen. Uh, we have a virtual queue, <coughs> uh, so that's the first time for us. So uh, we hope we'll manage that if anyone comes. <coughs> But uh, if you come on the mic, please be aware that some other people might be waiting behind you, even if you don't see them. Um, 
very rapidly as a working group summary. Uh, from that point on, we will try to, uh, when we will do working group last calls, uh, to also call for shepherds uh, to see if anyone w wants to volunteer. Uh, we have today, typically, we have uh, Mac, uh, who is a shepherd for the, the two MIB uh, drafts that we, we have uh, in IESG. Uh, otherwise, we're doing the, the job. But uh, if people want to uh, experience uh, what uh, shepherd uh, job is, uh, they'll be welcome. We might not do it for each and every draft, but uh, just a heads up that you can volunteer if you want. Uh, since uh, last IETF, we've had four RFCs, four new RFCs. We went three, uh, through three working group last call and adopted five uh, new working group documents. And uh, a reminder of uh, a policy that we have discussed all together and have decided to implement uh, regarding uh, requiring, if I may use that term, uh, uh, one implementation before moving forward. <clears throat> so I need to reread that because I don't remember all the details. Um, but so at the time uh, we will issue a working group last call, we will ask for knowledge of implementations. Uh, and the more you can provide details so that we, we understand the effective existence of uh, the implementation, the better. There is no specific requirement on how much details you are expected to provide. Uh, of course. Um, if there is an implementation, we'll move through uh, IESG. Um, in the opposite situation, we will uh, get back to the working group asking if the absence of an implementation is blocking or not. Uh, will George uh, go George consensus on that? And depending uh, on the result, we will uh, proceed with uh, going to IESG or not. Um, we have a bunch of expired working group documents. The first two one are quite famous because they've been ex in that state for very long. Um, so we need to decide to, what to do with that. If any author or non-author wants to pick up the job and to re-edit them, fine. Otherwise, we might uh, update uh, the, the milestones and simply, uh, simply make these uh, disappear. Uh, for the last four. Yes, yeah, so on this draft, if there are co-authors co in the room that want to say a word on the, their draft, they're welcome. <coughs> uh, yeah, we should uh, we will refresh the FATSO The what? We will refresh the FATSO uh, draft. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, but um, these are the last four. So the last four uh, expire, uh, have expired very recently, so I don't expect them to uh, die, uh, but just want to make sure uh, with the authors that there is no blocking point. <coughs> uh, this is our queue. Uh, we have five, nine working groups uh, documents post uh, working group last call at different stages. Uh, so this is clearly on our uh, plate as chairs. And uh, this is the list of the plan and upcoming uh, working group last calls and uh, working group adoptions. So I guess, Sami, you are reassured, as well as Imanshu. <laughs> uh, and this is the agenda uh, to note that uh, I think we really did, um, enfin, you all really did much better than the previous meeting with uh, a good proportion of uh, uh, the presentations being uh, uploaded uh, quite soon in the week. Thank you to all of you. And we will start with Patrice. Non, non, c'est pas très. Ouais, ouais c'était ça que je voulais faire, mais, mais je voulais, je sais plus, c'est contrôle. Je suis fermé.
sans doute. Non, ça marche pas. Ah, ça marche pas Non, tu dois me dire. Ouais. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Patrice Brisset uh, from Cisco. Um, I'm here to go through the Yang activity that we've been doing for L2 VPN and L3 VPN. Um, so it's all bundled into one presentation, so only 10 minutes. All right. Next slide, please. Okay, so for L2 VPN Yang, uh, it's been there already. The work has been uh, started like one year ago. Uh, we presented in Prague and Yokohama. And um, uh, so what we, where, where it stands right now, I think it's pretty rock solid. We've been through a lot of discussion. We revamped the structures, uh, the containers. We add also reference to eVPN, so eVPN can work on the on the Eltrican model. And um, we also added the OPER data. So this is mainly where Eltrican stand today. Uh, I think the, the next step for the Eltrican will be um, some clarification regarding the interfaces, um, set of wires and AC. Uh, there's already a lot of discussion happening for the interface Yang and set of wire Yang. So th that's gonna be, I think, our next focus. Um, all right, next slide, please. And also, yeah, we, we also did, we want also to go through what group adoption, so I think we talked about that already, right? So that's pretty much, uh, it for L2VPN Yang, so if you have question or just ping me after, uh, you can go through what's in on the web now. I think it's pretty solid. And yeah, you mentioned, sorry. I have some comments. Um, the, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that have uh, come up in the PAL working group. Um, it's about the pseudo wire Yang model and the L2 service model. And I'm just making a comment here at the mic. Uh, will also reply. Uh, reply uh, actually, have replied on the mailing list. But I think when when we started this uh, design team meeting for the L2VPN, we always uh, thought thought about taking on the Ethernet part of it first. So we have defined the Ethernet uh, related services and the pseudo wires. And after that is done, we will take over, we'll take, undertake the TDM and ATM and frame delay and all that with the VPWS services. So that's the follow on work that we are going to do. And, and we believe that we have a good design team interactions going on. So it would be better if we continue the work there. The second thing is the service model. I, <clears throat> we we think that service model should also be part of this base L2 VPN Yang model, and it can be just a augmentation of that because it's a subset of that, and that is also we had discussed in the mid design team meeting, and that's what we are planning to do, <clears throat> and I'm sure Adrian has a different view, or some view. <laughs> Uh, Adrian Farrell, I just want to comment on that from the perspective of the L3SM working group and what happened there. Um, okay, so that was doing the layer three VPN service model um, and was obviously at a slightly different time line from, because the device models were maybe not as, uh, as well established. What we found there was that it was critically important to drive the service model work from the people that uh, use and uh, operate the service model. And that is to say uh, network operators and um, hopefully uh, enterprises. And uh, the equipment vendors who uh, have lots of clue about what this means in the network are not necessarily the best people to understand the business models and the service offerings of the operators. So wherever that type of service model work is done, uh, and it may well be an augmentation or a, a document edit of um, the device model, I would urge that it is uh, very thoroughly driven by operators and not vendors. Yeah, one comment on the, the question of uh 
L2 service models, uh, we have a draft on the agenda today uh, on the proposed uh, service model for L2. Uh, we put it uh, on the agenda <coughs> uh, not necessarily thinking that uh, uh, it would be work to do in best, but uh, because we had uh, some uh, start concerns, so we had room in the agenda for it. Uh, but the, the, the idea was to precisely discuss uh, uh, the kind of things we are, we are discussing and coordinate with uh, uh, working group doing service models, uh, whatever S3SM may do in the layer two domain uh, in the future. But we can discuss this also well. Right. Uh, just to address uh, Himanshu Shah from Siena, just to address Adrian's comment, uh, we do have a lot of operators in the design team. So uh, we have that focus, even though it is the device model. But we also find that mo most of this service model has a very few delta than what we have in the design model. It's a subset. It almost is a subset and maybe a little bit of delta with respect to the service. So. I think we are well equipped to undertake that work because we do have uh, operators participation. So, but yeah, of course, yeah, there is a, as he said, you know, there is a service model uh, draft. We should uh, look into that. There's also room that if other operators want to join the team and help, especially when we're going to start talking more about the service model, it's fine. Um, there was also, I saw something out from Paul's that there was a, another L2 service model um, doing L2VPN. And basically it was almost like trying to redefine what we were doing here after a year of work. Um, this, I don't think it's a good idea. So we already talked to those folks and we're gonna try to uh, come up to a solution for that. So anything else on L2 uh, VPN, yeah, uh, you or? That's okay, perfect, okay. Okay, EVPN, EVPN I will be, yeah, it's a bit faster on that one. So um, we missed the target for this ITF to present the latest version. Um, we have it, I have it on my computer, just didn't have time to put it on the web, um, unfortunately, but it's gonna, it's gonna be out very soon. Basically what we've done is uh, add the OPER, uh, a lot of OPER information for, um, for the EVPN. And we reshuffled a couple of bits and bytes um, where uh, the folks from Nokia helped on that one. So thanks to you guys, right? Um, so I think that's pretty much it for eVPN, unless anybody else wants to add something on. All right, and the last one is, yeah, L3 VPN Yang. Yeah, so um, Denendra here from Cisco helped a lot on that one. And I'm glad about this. So what, what happens is there were two proposals running in parallel, like the, uh, the lead BES and KR uh, BES draft. And um, after the discussion, they've been merged into that new one, the, the, the one mentioned on the first line. So basically there's, uh, there's been a good consensus. I think people were happy. And what we've been doing is um, creating VERF and BGP knobs for the L3 config. And we did augment a bunch of other drafts that we are based on. So do you want to add comments, Danendra? Yeah, hi, I'm Danin from Cisco, uh, one of the authors in the L3VPN Yang model. I uh, wanted to add uh, a couple of points about the last two bullets here. Uh, firstly, the work parameters are uh, designed by augmenting the IETF net mode routing model by because the work, the notion of work is realized by uh, instance in the uh, routing instance from this model, but in the recent um, version of it, uh, the routing instance not does not exist in that uh, model. So I think uh, we'll have to make some updates to align it with network instance uh, container from the device model instead, and we'll make the updates uh, uh, regarding that. Uh, secondly, the BGP parameters for L3VPN are uh, provided by augmenting uh, the suitable containers from the IDR BGP model, and to get the uh, to 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 augment the BGP containers in the context of WERF, we'll have to have uh, BGP aligned with network instance model as well. So these are the, the two comments I wanted to make about the last two bullets point bullet points. All right. So next slide, please. So I guess uh, please have a look to those three Yang model and 
feel free to send emails to us, feedbacks, everything is welcome. If everyone else also wants to pitch in and help, um, as I mentioned, especially on the L2SS, L2SM model, uh, or like providers, you're welcome. So that's it. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Next speaker is Zem Kyung. I don't know if I got the name right. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jin Chang from Tan Mobile. Uh, the, the title of my talk is uh, Connecting IP Rainfall Island over IPv6 and PRS using uh, 4PE. Uh, this is the first time to present this document. So uh, the picture at the bottom of this slide shows the scenario to be addressed. Uh, when IPv6 only networks uh, are widely deployed, how to provide uh, the connectivity for the remaining IPv4 only islands uh, will become a problem. Uh, RFC uh, 7439 uh, gap analysis for operating IPv6 only MPRS networks uh, had already pointed out uh, this gap. So for PE, uh, IPv4 provider edge routers is proposed in this document to uh, to meet the gap. Uh, and by the way, uh, RFC 4798, uh, IPv6 provider edge routers is used to address the reverse scenario, uh, connecting IPv6 only uh, islands through IPv4 on an NPS network. Uh, uh, to to address the uh, uh, the above scenario, we have to do uh, the following two things. Uh, first, uh, you change IPv4 reachability information among for P routers. Uh, the second thing is to transport IPv4 packets from the uh, egress uh, for P router to the uh, from the ingress for P router to the egress for P router. Uh, for the first thing. Uh, a uh, multi protocol BGP is intended with uh, a new uh, SAFI, a subsequent address family identifier. Uh, this new SAFI is called uh, uh, 4PE SAFI. Uh, for the second thing, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when the ingress 4PE router receives packets from the IPv4 islands, it uh, looks up uh, in the IPv4 routing table. If the match Table entry is learned from other uh, 4P router. Uh, Ingress 4PE uses the IPv6 next hop to, uh, to reach the corresponding Ingress 4PE router through the IPv6 LSP. So, this is the format for the uh, 4PE as AFI. Here, I want to emphasize this, uh, 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 the IPv6 next hop, IPv6. IPv4 next hop, IPv6 next hop, and the label for the, uh, for the IPv4 rules uh, are carried in this uh, SAFI. Um, uh, a new value uh, is solicited to be assigned for, uh, for the SAFI to indicate uh, this one is uh, for, for PSAFI. And uh, 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 the IPv4 next hop is encoded in the uh, network address of next hop field, uh, IPv6 next hop, and the MPS label are encoded in the NLRI uh, part. Next one. So, uh, when uh, 4PE received, IP, uh, received uh, the 4PE SAFI, um, since uh, uh, this kind of SAFI is a kind of a multi protocol BGP message, the 4PE router treats it. Uh, as uh, as specified in uh, RFC 4760 and uh, uh, RFC 3107, uh, but uh, for P router must distinguish the IPv4 rules uh, learned from the uh, the for P rules and those uh, routers and those from the IPv4 only island directly connected to it. Uh, for P router must establish the relation between 
uh, IP version 4 next hop, IP version 6 next hop, and the MPS label uh, carried in, in this kind of SAFI. Uh, so this re relation for P routers can get uh, MPS label and IP version 6 uh, next hop using uh, the, uh, the IP version 4 next hop. Uh, but the methods uh, to to do this uh, is uh, implementation issue. We do not specify that in uh, in this document. Yes. Uh, so when when for PE router receives IP one four packet, uh, it treats the the, the 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 packet as normal uh, for PE uh, as normal IP one four router does, except in the following steps. Uh, if the matching uh, uh, route for this packet is learned from uh, other 4P routers. Uh, the 4P router has uh, further to get the IP16 next hop uh, and the MPS label uh, using the matching uh, IP14 next hop. Uh, then uh, the 4P router uses uh, uh, the IP16 next hop to look up in its IP16 routing table uh, to get the IP16 RSP to reach the egress. 4P router. Uh, next uh, is the encapsulation. 4P router encapsulates the received IP version 4 pack using two labels. Uh, the outer uh, uh, label is the uh, IP version 6 is for the IP version 6 RSP. Uh, the inner label is for the uh, for the IP version 4 routes. Uh, <clears throat> after the encapsulation, uh, the ingress for P uh, forward uh, the packet towards the egress for the router through the IP 6 RSP. Yeah. So for INR requirements, uh, a new SAFI is, uh, is needed, uh, and number nine uh, is suggested. Yeah. Uh, 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 this, uh, this draft has been discussed in the mailing list. Uh, Eric uh, thinks uh, RFC 5549 uh, is an alternative uh, uh, option to, to address the scenario. Uh, but uh, as shown in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in this figure, uh, there's no uh, IP version 4 next hop information uh, is carried in, uh, in, 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 in RFC uh, 5549. Uh, uh, only the uh, IPv6 next hop is included uh, is, uh, is encoded in the uh, network address of the next hop field. Uh, so, uh, since uh, since this solution doesn't carry uh, IPv4 next hop for IPv4 rules, how to install uh, those IPv4 rules in the uh, IPv4 routing table is the problem, I think. Uh, but Eric uh, insists this is not uh, this is the implementation issue. So here I want to know uh, your idea. Which uh, solution do you think is better? Okay, uh, that's all. Thank you. I'm Mr. Francisco. Uh, I have a question. I'm wondering if uh, these different IPv4, can you hear me? So, uh, uh, right, no matter. I'm not making a comment. <laughs> so, Ali suggested Cisco. So, I'm wondering uh, when you want to connect these islands of V4 over V6, if these V4 island, you know, gets treated as their own ASS, then we run inter AS option B among these different islands. That should just work because with uh, Option B, we terminate the V4 and V6 tunnel and the ASPRs, and everything should work as is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. So is this is basically uh, the solution that you're proposing. You're assuming that you cannot uh, model the islands as individual ASs? Uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, this this scenario is not VPN based. Uh, uh, I cannot uh, I remember the detail of, 
option B. I'm sorry, but the, okay. the, this this is not a VPN based. Yes, this is not VPN based. Okay, all right. Kair Patel, Cisco. Um, I just have two comments. Uh, I believe I agree with uh, Eric's comments that 5549 should be sufficient here, RFC. You look at the length of the next stop, and depending on what the length of the next stop is, you can you can install in inappropriate tables, and that should be sufficient for your case. Yeah, with Hendrix and okay, I agree with Kiura and Eric as well, is that 5549 has been has been built to actually solve this case, and it has been implemented already. So I think there's nothing missing in 5549 to do this. So, so you must not think uh, IP uh, verified next stop is not needed for for the IP for routing table installation, right? No, you advertise it in the backbone, which supports PLS v6 only, right? Or is your what is your question or your remark that you have a dual stack backbone with MPLS? Only, only IPv6, no IPv4. Then you don't need a V4 next up in the MPLS backbone. Yes, but the 4B router do need this information to install as IPv4 routing. Yes, but that's before you redistribute the route uh, in the in the core, right? So uh, we would encourage you to uh, to clarify on the mailing list the, the, the points that you think are problematic in, um, uh, I don't remember the RC number, RC 5549. Um, so we encourage you to discuss on the list what you think uh, is problematic in the existing solution. That's been uh, reminded. That's the useful next step. Thank you. Um, next speaker is uh, Jeffrey. I'm Jeffrey Zhang, uh, here to re uh, present uh, best EVPN bound procedure updates, uh, revision 01, uh, with co authors Wen, Ho He, and Kyo. Next slide. I have presented this uh, draft before. Um, we want to progress the drafts and seeking working group uh, adoption. Um, there is one thing that we want to clarify. Uh, in particular, the relationship with another recent draft from uh, Ali uh, about uh, selection modcast in eVPN. So um, I want to do a representation uh, presentation here, uh, go over the uh, primary concepts and then with, uh, the comparison. Um, in summary, um, this draft covers two aspects. Uh, the first one is uh, selection modcast based on the SPNZ uh, leaf AD auto discovery routes. Um, we will go into uh, high-level details uh, in later slides. Um, that procedure, SPNZ DVD procedure, um, that is based on the VPL Smartcast RFC 7117, which originally came from uh, MVPN and uh, procedures. The next one is the inter-region tunnel segmentation, where a region could be an AES area or even sub-area. When those uh, regional border routers uh, are the segmentation points. Again, it's similar to MVPN inter AS inter area segmentation using the uh, PIMZ uh, DIF AD routes. Next slide. So you can see that, that the key concept here is a PIMZ DIF AD procedure. So what are they? Uh, first of all, PIMZ uh, stands for Provider Multicast Service Interface. It's a conceptual interface used for uh, sending uh, customer multicast traffic across the provider uh, network. Um, it could be inclusive PNZ or selective PNZ. In the, in the case of selective PNZ, you, the traffic is only sent to a selective uh, set of the uh, PEs in a VPN or a EVPN. That concept um, originated from uh, MAPN, uh, adopted in MVPN multicast, and equally applies to EVPN as well. Although in EVPN they have different names, inclusive multicast um, Ethernet tag routes or selective multicast Ethernet tag, uh, tag routes, similar to uh, the I, uh, IPNZ or SPNZ. 
Um, so the purpose of Pinsy routes is for ingress PE to announce what tunnel is used to instantiate that uh, that Pinsy, and what flow is bound to uh, is bound to that uh, Pinsy. That route includes a provider tunnel attribute that specifies the tunnel information. In the case of SPMZ, it includes the flow information, SG, where both S and G could be wildcards. So if an egress router gets a SPMZ routes, uh, see the tunnel announced in that routes, if it needs to join that tunnel because it has local receivers, it can uh, do uh, one of the uh, following ways depending on the tunnel that is being announced. If it's a pin tunnel, the egress router just send pin joins uh, uh, to join the pin tunnel in the underlay in the provider network. If it's MLDB tunnel, it sends label mapping. For other tunnel types, including ingress replication, RCP, P2MP, tunnel, or beer, then the egress router needs to send leaf AD routes so that um, the ingress router knows that those routes, those routers, those PEs need to be in the tunnel. So the ingress PE can set up the tunnel, set up the forwarding state. Next slide. Tunnel segmentation. An uh, end-to-end P2P-P-P-P tunnel um, maybe consists of segments of intra-AS or intra-area uh, tunnels. Um, in, uh, in those different AS or different area, you may be using different tunnel types or even uh, different uh, instances of tunnel, even if they have the same type. Um, for example, you may be using MLDB tunnel in AS1, RCP tunnel in AS2, or uh, ingress river in yet another AS. The reason for, for those differences could be uh, for technical reasons or for administrative reasons. Um, another use case of the segmented tunnel is that in case of ingress replication, for example, you have a, a large network with 1,000 PEs. If you use ingress replication, uh, the ingress PE has to replicate 1,000 times to reach all those PEs, which may be too much. But if you segment that into different areas, so that uh, the ingress PE only replicates to the PEs in, the, in its own area, and the, P, and the area border routers in that uh, in the uh, uh, area, and then that led the uh, uh, area border routers to further replicate to the downstream PEs and downstream uh, ABRs in the next area. That will reduce the replication uh, fan out. Similarly, beer, if you have a large beer domain, for example, 1,000 PEs, then you either have to use a bit string, beer bit string, and one uh, a ten of 24, or if you use uh, the uh, shorter bit strings uh, length 256, then you have to send four copies. But if you use uh, segmentation, you can divide that uh, beer domain to say four subdomains, each with 256 nodes, then you only need to send packet once and still use that shorter bit string uh, length. Um, so for MVPN, um, inter-AS segmentation is covered in the RFC 5514. For inter-area, it's covered in an RFC 7524. For EV EVPN, these drafts, uh, EVPN bound procedure of these drafts uh, covers that. In fact, it's generalized it to inter-region segmentation, whether it's AS, area, or sub-area. How tunnel segmentation is done, it's basically when, when the regional border router, or ASBR or ABR, receives that uh, PINZ route, before it re it to the next region, it changes the tunnel type or tunnel ID in, that, in their route to what is used in that next region. And then the PEs or uh, uh, further, uh, the RBRs down, further down below in, in that region join the tunnel segment for that particular region, again, by sending pin join, MLDP, uh, label mapping, or sending corresponding leaf AD routes so that the upstream uh, uh, RBR, the regional border routes, can, can discover the, lead, the leaves. Next slide. 
So um, one special note about uh, inclusive PMZ routes, uh, that route could be per PE or per region. For the per PE IPMZ route, uh, route, it identifies a PE. In the MVPN case, that's the MV MVPN type one route or it's called intra AS IPMZ AD routes. For the EVPN case, that's uh, the inclusive multicast Ethernet tag route defined in uh, RFC 7432, it's the EMP type 3 route. Now, for the per region IPNZ route, it identifies a region that allows aggregation from individual PEs uh, to regions. When the region uh, RBRs receive the per P IPNZ routes, they do not just uh, propagate it for, across the border to other regions. They suppress those per PE routes. Instead, they can uh, originate a per region uh, IPNZ route, and those per PE ones will be summarized in, into the per region IPNZ route. For MVPN, that's um, type two route, inter AS IPNZ route. Um, the NRI of that route basically includes the AS number, because um, the uh, MVPN only supports the per uh, the AS level uh, aggregation. When it comes to EVPN, um, this uh, the draft um, uh, EVPN bound procedure update drafts uh, generalize it to, so that the region can be uh, AS area or sub area. Now, uh, the NRI uh, encode instead of just an AS number, it encodes uh, eight octets. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, eight active field that, that is basically encoded uh, just like extended community. There, with that, it can uh, give us maximum flexibility. Uh, for example, that extended community could be a uh, AS specific uh, extended community identifying uh, AS. It could be an IP address specific uh, community identifying uh, uh, OSPF area, or it could be uh, just a raw target. That's uh, yeah, it's used uh, for the routers, uh, uh, PEs or RBRs in that region to to propagate routes with. Um, so in fact, this uh, changes in the per region IPNG routes encoding is the main difference between the zero and zero one version. Next slide. Finally, the relationship between uh, this bound procedure update draft and uh, Ali's uh, uh, proxy draft. Ali's draft covers two aspects. The first one is that turn the IGMP MLD soft state messages of the overlay into BGP EVP and SMAN routes, the, the, the hard state uh, routes. Second, those SMAN routes allows the ingress P or all the PEs to track the egress piece that leads to receive traffic for a particular flow. And then it can, uh, can, you, uh, can send the traffic only to those selective set of PEs that need to receive traffic. So you can no notice that these two drafts all cover one uh, uh, area of selective multicast. What's the relationship between them? I want to say that um, these two drafts are complementary. They are not mutually ex exclusive. The SMAN routes in draft suggesty work well uh, if you are using the ingress replication or beer tunnel in, in your network, uh, especially if you are, you are use, it's, not non, it's not segmented. In all other situations, for example, uh, you have to use segmented tunnels across a different AS, different area, or if you have to use PIM or MLDP or RCPTP to MP tunnel. Or even if you are not doing uh, segmentation and you, you, are, you are indeed using ingress replication or beer, but as long as you um, want to inclusive tunnel for most of your traffic, but only want to use selective tunnel for some of your traffic, some heavy traffic, in that case, you still want to uh, use the SPNG DVD route procedure. The reason is that um, so that for most of the flow, you do not need to track your uh, the, uh, egress piece that need to receive traffic. 
you don't need to, to, to do that tracking. That's SMAT does, uh, the SMAT ROS gave you. Only for those selective, uh, certain traffic that you want to use selective tunnel for, only for those ones, you need to track where the egress piece are. And for, for that purpose, you can use SPNZ leafy routes to announce the flows and tunnels for those, uh, uh, and then uh, use the corresponding leaf AD routes to, to find out where the egress piece are. Thanks. So that is basically an overview of what um, the draft is about, and in particular about the relationship between the two drafts when it comes to selective multicast. Um, this, we have, um, uh, uh, we posted a, a 01 version quite some time ago. Uh, we, next week, we will uh, post another re uh, revision with some auditorial changes. And with that, we, we want to call for, we'd like to uh, uh, seek a uh, working group uh, comment and adoption. Um, that, that adoption call will be after we post the next revision that should happen next week. So for now, it's a pre-request comments for. So uh, who has uh, read this document? Um, so uh, So uh, we, we encourage uh, uh, everyone to read the draft, to have uh, more readers, in, partic in particular people uh, uh, who've uh, focused, uh, spend, well, spend time on uh, writing EVPN specs. Thank you. Thank you. So next speaker is uh, Jorge. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Jorge Rabadan, Nokia. And this draft is about uh, preference-based uh, deflection. Uh, well, those are my authors. This is a uh, draft zero zero, but we published this one uh, a few months ago. So hopefully you had the, the chance to, to go through it. Next slide, please. So what is this about? The, um, so in RFC 7432, there is a, a DF election defined based on service carving. There is one more draft about DF election based on HRW. But still, we had the, uh, coming from uh, multiple service providers, we had the request to, to do yet one more DF election type. And the reason why is because we needed things like uh, the ability to preempt a given DF at any moment in time, in an easy way, with a, an admin preference value that you can actually configure uh, on a per EVI or ICID basis. And we also had the request of um, having a revertive and non-revertive operation. So at the moment, uh, RFC 7432, the selection is, is always revertive, which means that if the TF goes down, someone else uh, takes over, but when the former TF comes back up, it will take over again. So you actually impact, you are impacting the service twice. So the solution basically takes care of uh, all those things, and uh, it works for single active, all active, EVPN, PVE, VPN, uh, EVPN, VPWS, and uh, also for virtual or non-virtual Ethernet segments. Next slide, please. The um, BGP attributes, um, we're actually not defining any new attribute. So we have in the, uh, the existing um, BES um, DF election draft, there is a, a new extended community defined, and this extended community is called the DF election extended community. And in there, there is a DF type. 
So uh, that type is, is covering at the moment uh, th three different values. So type zero is what 7432 says, so the default service carving. Type one is what, uh, what we have in the DF election draft, HRW algorithm. And this document is actually defining a new type, type two. And this is the preference based algorithm. So when the, uh, the type is two in the extended community, we are using two more pieces of information. So the first one is the, uh, what we call the DP bit, the don't preempt me bit. And that is used for the non-revertive operation of the, uh, of the document. The other piece of information is the TF preference. That is um, <coughs> a two byte value allows you to define up to 64K values, and the default should be the middle point, 32K. So the idea is that all the, uh, the P's will exchange uh, this extended community with this preference value, and uh, <coughs> basically the preference value will be taken into account for the, for the TF election. It will be uh, like something like the highest preference, or you, you could even define the, the lowest preference. And this DP bit, will be used as a tiebreaker. Next slide, please. So this is how it works. So the first step you have, let's say uh, in this example, you have three PEs, P1, 2, and 3. You have two Ethernet segments. Uh, Ethernet segment 1 goes to P1 and 2. Ethernet segment 2 goes to the three PEs. And uh, the first step is to provision the, uh, the Ethernet segment. So here, Obviously, there because you need you want to have full control, you really need to provision the Ethernet segment and the uh, and an admin uh, preference. So, uh, if you have multiple EVIs or ICs within the same Ethernet segment, you can also configure ranges. And for instance, yeah, you can say uh, EVI range one from one to one hundred. We are going to take the highest preference for the DF election, whereas for a, a separate range, you can use the lowest preference. So once you do that, and the Ethernet segment uh, comes up, comes up, basically the, uh, the P's, they start exchanging uh, these preference values. And, uh, and finally, when they exchange the, uh, uh, these values and the DF election timer expires, each P will uh, elect a DF for a given Ethernet segment. The, uh, the idea is that the, um, the TF election type has to be consistent across the P's in the Ethernet segment. So as soon as you have one P that is not sending the extended community with type two, you need to fall back to this, the default service carving that you have in 7432. The other consideration is that the, in, the, in the candidate um, list for the TF, you will have the IPs ordered by the preference, the DP bit, and also the P address. So in case of the, the same preference value and DP bit, the P address will be the tiebreaker as well. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and finally, the, uh, the, uh, the non-revertive uh, operation. This is also uh, something that we, uh, we were requested, and uh, the idea is the following. You have this DP bit like you exchange in the uh, in the extended community. So uh, when you start and the Ethernet segment comes comes uh, comes up, basically the P's they will exchange the, the preference value and also the DP bit. So if you configure the Ethernet segment to be uh, non-revertive, it means that the DP bit will be one. So it, the deflection timer expires, the P is a uh, elected DF, and then once, once that happens, they will advertise the DP bit. Now, if uh, let's say the, the DF in this, uh, in the, uh, the uh, left-hand side of the slide, uh, the bottom uh, P is the DF. Uh, let's say it fails, it goes down, and, uh, and then the second P takes over, because it has the, the second best uh, preference. What happens if the bottom P now comes back up again? So what it will happen is that the, uh, the bottom P uh, comes up. Uh, it will have some timers. Uh, if it 
reboot it. Basically, it, it will be a, there will be a boot timer. If the Ethernet segment went, uh, went down and up, it'll be um, a hold, uh, hold timer. So you need to allow some timer so that the P can collect all the, the routes for the same Ethernet segment. And once that happens, basically, the P will run the TF election and we'll see that uh, he has a better admin preference, but P2, that is the, the current DF, he has this DP bit set. So if you want a non-reversive operation. So what the, uh, the bottom P will do is actually not to send the uh, admin preference, but to send an operational preference. And that operational preference will be a value equal the, uh, the max of the, uh, the preference values for the Ethernet segment, in this case, 200. And it will send that Ethernet segment route with a DP bit zero. So when the bottom P sends that route, that is not going to um, basically cause any impact on the other P's. The, the other P's will, will keep their current, their current uh, DF election, right? Because again, the, uh, the highest preference is the is best, but the, the DP bit is used as a tiebreaker. So the second P, because it has the DP bit set, uh, it will be uh, still the, uh, the DF. So next slide, please. So as a conclusion, basically uh, we have new requirements for this DF election um, that are not covered in 7.432, uh, mainly coming from service providers. Um, we needed this preference-based uh, DF election. We need some, uh, some deterministic behaviors and, and full control over the DF election. And we also need this non-revertive behavior. So all those things are uh, the things that we are covering with this document. So uh, we, uh, well, next steps, of course, we, uh, we are looking for more comments, especially from service providers and, and other vendors as well. And uh, we would normally not request a working group adoption for a draft which is zero, zero, but in, in this case, um, so what the feedback that we collected so far is, is so good and, and there's so much interest that we really think uh, we should make it a working group document. And that's it for this one. So uh, can we have an idea of uh, the number of people who have read the document? Next one is the AC influenced uh, DF election for VPN. So this is not a new draft. Um, uh, this is the list of my authors. This is uh, revision three. So next, please. What is this about? A short uh, refresher of the, the problem we want to solve. Um, again, it's all about DF election. So in uh, RFC 7432, uh, basically, you have this uh, DF election at uh, ESI EVI level, and um, and basically the DF election is is able to uh, the whole multi homing is able to converge when you have a, a physical port failure, right? But the um, the RFC seven four three two does does not cover uh, these logical failures or attachment circuit failures, right? And what we mean by attachment circuit is. Uh, a customer VLAN or a VLAN bundle, right, in case of VLAN bundle or VLAN aware bundle. So um, cases that we are covering with this uh, are, for instance, when uh, with the, in this example in the figure, when the attachment circuit number two uh, goes admin or up or down, or is not provisioned yet, right, but the physical port is still up. So when that happens, a P2 is not going to uh, withdraw the AES route, right? Uh, and as a result of that, according to, to RFC 7432, there will not be a, a, you know, a new TF for the given EVI. The, the other example would be the, the MAC DRF is admin shut down or even not provisioned yet, right? In that case, uh, you might have, a, again, a black hole, right? 
So uh, um, the other consideration is that in, in VPLS, there is actually a solution for PGP multi-homing uh, covering these cases, right? You have a, a way to advertise whether an attachment circuit is up or down, and that is taken into account in the DF election algorithm. So we actually needed to have the, the same thing in EVPN. So next slide, please. So what is the solution? Uh, the so solution is basically uh, taking advantage of what is already there, right? So we are not uh, defining any new control plane procedure or any new component. We are just reusing what is there. And what is there is the AD per EVI routes. So when you have a logical failure on P2, if uh, attachment circuit two goes down, P2 will withdraw the AD per EVI route for the Ethernet segment and the EVI. So you actually already have a notification, an indication that the attachment circuit went down. And actually that's needed because in P4, which is a remote P, you need to remove P2 from the list of um, P's for a given remote Ethernet segment or the Ethernet segment one, two. So that's already there. It's already used as a notification on P4. So what we are doing here is to take, to use that notification also in P1 so that P1 can actually take over as the TF for that EVI. And that's how it works. So is this backwards compatible with RFC 7432? Absolutely. We are not defining any new stuff. We are only modifying the, the candidate list of P's for a given, uh, for, for a given Ethernet segment. We are influencing that list and if, uh, if there is no any AT EVI rod for a given P, we actually remove a given P from the list for the, the DF election candidate list. But that's it. Having said that, um, we, we've actually tested um, in public events already, uh, implementations doing this with implementations not doing that. What that means is that uh, in a given Ethernet segment, for instance, ESI 12, if P1 or P2 are, uh, you know, implementing this document, this draft, but the other one is not, everything will work. If you implement this, you will get the benefit of avoiding this black hole. If you don't, you're still RFC 7432 compliant. Next slide, please. So what do we change in revision three? So we have a new author, Adam from uh, Ericsson, and uh, in, in, in intent of uh, having a, another implementation. Uh, the other thing we did is, in the previous um, version, we were not only taking care of EVPN, but also of uh, PBB EVPN. But for PBB EVPN, there are no AD routes. So we were actually adding AD routes now that is that was indeed uh, creating new control plane components, so we decided to get rid of that. So the current version of the draft only covers EVPN and not PVB EVPN. And as a result of that, we changed the intended status to informational because it no longer introduces any control plane component, and the solution is fully backwards compatible with 7432. So as a result of that, it makes sense to, to leave it as informational. Next slide, please. So next steps, um, well, we want more, more feedback given the, the new revision of the draft. And uh, we uh, really appreciate uh, any feedback. And, uh, and yeah, we would like to solicit the working group adoption. Uh, this is the, uh, the version three, and, and I think uh, now it's ready. Alex, I just uh, I got a question, and uh, as you mentioned, in seven, <coughs> RFC 7432, the ES is defined based on the physical, and we monitor the physical status, and if there is a failure, the DF election kicks in, and this refines it to the, uh, on a VLAN basis for that physical interface. So, uh, do you envision a given customer running Ether OEM on every single VLAN of that Ethernet segment? 
there's a quite a much of overhead for it. There, uh, well, the answer to that is uh, maybe yes, especially not in. I don't envision that happening in all active because it's not possible. But in single active and uh, multi-home networks, it's perfectly possible that a, a given customer uses Ethernet OAM. So what happens when we have, because they're not, uh, you know, uh, typically when they run it, they don't run it on every, on all of the VLANs. They run it on the, some of the VLANs that is very important to them, not on all. Now, if I have a mix, some VLANs I'm running either OEM for monitoring that I know that I can find out their status and other VLANs I don't. How would this algorithm work? Again, if a, a given attachment circuit goes down for some reason, you can withdraw the AD, EDI route. Otherwise, you, you don't. Right. So, so it doesn't um, basically doesn't <coughs> monitor the full uh, status of the attachments because some of the attachments might not be running Ether OEM to be monitored. And it, this can only monitor that the one that have the Ether OEM. But this is not monitoring the end. They see that's uh, that's up to the operator to do it. But so, uh, what this no, no. is, you... this is basically also uh, if you, uh, as I was saying in the examples, even if the attachment circuit is, is shut down or is not even configured, this is also taking care of that case, right? For the Ethernet CFM, yeah. If the operator decides to, if the attachment use, circuit is not configured, you're not going to be sending Ether AD per EVI for that attachment circuit to begin with. Correct, but the DF selection still happens based on the Ethernet segment, which is already there. Right. So that is okay. Uh, some uh, misconfiguration in case mm -hmm. there there is any. Uh, so I. What the, my take on this is basically this is a, uh, I mean, it is an optimization. The question is, you change that to informational? Yeah. This is? Okay. This revision is. So I guess if it is informational, it's okay. <laughs> it's a, a valid optimization. It's, and it's implemented. It's there. So, and it works and it's proven. So. Right. It is an optimization. Uh, uh, and I guess uh, uh, whether uh, how big optimization or uh, whether that optimization is justified, then it is on the eye of the beholder. Of course. <laughs> that is reset, Cisco. A uh, quick question regarding the. Um, the um, the failure case. What is happening with the um, ES EAD route? So that one is it? Are you changing that part, or this is no, 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 as no. before? Because no. in fact, if you have a failure, your ES EAD route will kick in, right? In your case or not? That's the question. Per, per ES? Yeah. No, that's per ES. Mm -hmm. If you have an individual attachment circuit failure, you are only withdrawing the AD per EBI route. So you're not touching at all the, uh, the no, of course not. As long as the Ethernet segment is still up, you, you cannot touch the uh, the Ethernet segment route and or the AAT per ES route. So basically, it's only VLAN failure. Case. In the case of sorry, it's only a VLAN failure case, not a main port failure. That's what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, no. If you have the the whole port failure, the Ethernet segment goes down, and then mm -hmm. it's regular seven four three two convergence, right? Okay. So isn't it like very similar to virtual ES? These things or not? So in the, in the virtual ES, you withdraw the ES route. If, mm -hmm. if, you have a, if the ES is associated to a VLAN, if the VLAN goes down, you withdraw the Ethernet segment mm -hmm. route itself, right? Yeah. So what is the benefit of this one? The physical, the physical port Ethernet segments, 7432. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, I was going to mention that, that uh, a big requirement is for virtual ES, and with the virtual ES, you know, we, uh, the whole thing is covered. But this optimization is when we got the physical Ethernet segment, and then we are trying to make, you know, monitor or take action on the individual yeah. VLANs for that physical Ethernet segment, right? That's right. Although 
it might have applications for virtual, certain uh, virtual Ethernet segments. VLANs within this uh, virtual Ethernet segment. When, when you associate a virtual Ethernet segment to more than one VLAN, for instance, but that's another thing we can discuss. Um, yeah. Next presentation. See you. See you. Yeah. Okay. This one is quick. Yeah. The quicker you are, the better. Okay. So vendor specific route for uh, VPN. So this is a list of my authors. So what are we trying to do here is uh, basically uh, uh, to request IANA for a, a new route type for VPN, right? Actually, route type 255. Why are we doing that? Um, we, we really want to have a vendor specific route type. Uh, why is that? Because we see there is a, a need to, for a, a rapid design of new applications, prototypes, and stuff like that, right? And, uh, and we want to, uh, to, you know, to do things in multi-vendor networks. Mm -hmm. So we want uh, things like uh, route reflectors to be able to, uh, to propagate something that is without looking into the, the, the details, right? without the, uh, the NLRI itself. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the other reason is, well, because sometimes you have vendors and they require to exchange specific information in a multi-vendor network, and this is one way of doing it, whereas some other vendors, they can use uh, some other ways, right? And then the third reason is because EVPN can do it. So we have uh, up to 255 uh, route types, so why not to take the uh, the type 255 and, and use it for, for this, right? So next slide, please. So the idea is, oh, it's a bit funny, okay. Anyway, uh, the idea, the NLRI, you have it on the right-hand side of the slide. Again, the, uh, the idea is to request value 255, and the NLRI would be uh, defined with a uh, route distinguisher and OUI, so an organization uh, unique identifier, which, uh, you know, it's the yeah, IEEE OUI, so you can, that's all right. So uh, it's, it's a well-known procedure to, to get a value and, uh, you know, most of the vendors, they have a bunch of them, so it can be used here. And then um, each vendor could actually define the, the key that they want to, to have in the, uh, in the NLRI um, for the PGP processing. Uh, you can define the, the key length. Oh, cool, thank you. <laughs> That's much better. You can define the, uh, the key length um, in the, uh, the specific key, and then the, re the rest of it is, is variable. So you can, you can put actually there whatever you want. So that's the idea. So I've asked for the, uh, the RFC 7606, the error handling uh, RFC. Basically, EVPN speakers that do not understand the, the route type will discard the route. So you will not flap the, the peering or anything like that. You just discard the route. So in a multi-vendor network, is the, if the uh, route reflector uh, supports this, even though it doesn't know what it's inside the vendor-specific information field, should be able to pick up the best route and reflect it to the rest of the piece. And the piece supporting this will process the route uh, at application level, and the piece not supporting this will simply uh, discard the route. So that's the, uh, the idea. Uh, next slide, please. And well, basically, we need to, uh, we want some feedback from the working group. So, Keir Patel Cisco, a uh, note to chairs. Um, you want this draft to run by IDR working group because it has implications on BGP. Second point. Uh, Can I reply to the first one? Sure. So, one thing that's important to note um, is that there is a very similar draft uh, proposed to, I, to IDR already. So, draft of like BGP OPEX signaling. Indeed. So it was presented yesterday. So. Not only we, it has implication on BGP, which has to be seen by LDR, that's true, but uh, at some point the question will have to be discussed on whether two drafts doing 
two things very similar uh, have to be progressed, uh, both of them or not. Correct. And, and the second point I had was you really want to very clearly articulate the application you are trying to do this for because, like Thomas said, there is a draft in IDR. The question would be why can we not do it on, on uh, if we could merge it to a single proposal, that would be even better. Uh, yeah, so the benefit we see here is that, um, well, for us, I am. Um, from our perspective, at least, uh, so a VPN is the, uh, we want to make it a, as a unified VPN control plane, right? And everything related to cloud, at least. At least. And, uh, you know, the route type is actually less disrupting than uh, an entire AFI SAFI, right? So, and uh, from an implementation perspective, we also think it's easier to implement. That's I think we should have a wider discussion on that. Yeah, but that's fine, yeah. Thank you. I guess uh, that's the advantage of what you mentioned is going to be faster implementation. Uh, I guess on the uh, minus side of it is if somebody uh, else wants to do the same thing in the IP VPN or L2 VPN, then they need to do it within their own AFI SAFI and repeat the work. But the, my question or comment actually is on something else. Uh, I'm. <coughs> As I, you know, I'm basically on the fence in here, but I have concern, uh, as I was mentioning to you, that I would prefer uh, the applications for the route to be more specific and we know the applications because currently we know all the routes which are in eVPN and IPVPN and we know the rate at which these routes get generated and all that. We define this blank route and we have no idea what would be the rate at which some of the PE is going to send this route to the route reflector and all that. And I, uh, my preference would be a more <coughs> either we specify the applications, what these are intended for, and specify some of these, or it is going to be a bit of concern. Yeah, so my, my comment to that is that um, obviously, I, as soon as there is a multi vendor interest in a given application, we need to, to standardize it properly and, uh, and take a, a given route type and, and have consensus and all that, right? But, uh, you know, we already have like uh, vendor specific things in other protocols like uh, LDP or, and it's, it's really um, almost unavoidable that uh, people are using, you know, existing AVPN and existing technologies for their own things. So this is kind of taking care of that and making sure that is that is within some uh, limits, right? Well, let's have more discussions on that. Okay, thanks. John Scudder, um, most of the points I might have made were already made. Um, I will add that one, um, just to the last point, one useful difference between your proposal and Peter's is that since his does run over a different FE SAFI, um, it's easily separated to a different um, route reflector plane um, if you want to contain, you know, any blowback from, you know, if it's extremely chatty or something like that. Yeah, I guess both have uh, pros and cons, yeah. Agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Sami. Yeah, but I don't know why. <laughs> so we'll skip the title. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't appear this way on my slides. Sorry for the authors. So if, if the if the if the tool uh, transforming your PowerPoint in PDF doesn't change for next meeting, uh, you'll be encouraged to submit PDFs that you will take care by yourself of being polished. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so yeah, my name is Sami Boutros, okay. I will skip the modest slides with the name. 
Uh, so now, we, uh, this draft is uh, title is EVPN auto provision. Um, the idea here is that uh, we want to uh, uh, provision uh, layer two and layer three services uh, on given switches or on a given uh, network based on first sign of life, and we want to use EVPN uh, to achieve that. So uh, the idea here is that on uh, a given, for example, data center network, uh, we may not know uh, in priority what kind of layer two and layer three services are going to be provisioned on a given switch. Uh, we know all the services that need to be enabled on the network, uh, but we don't know per switch um, uh, what services need to be provisioned there uh, in priority, right? Uh, so this is why we want to tie that to a first sign of life. Uh, and EVPN as a control plane allow us to do so uh, by having all uh, the uh, links on a given switch associated initially with uh, a default EVPN uh, instance, for example. Uh, and now when a first sign of life comes on a given switch, uh, we can encode into an EVPN and LRI enough information to be sent to a controller uh, and the controller can, in return, push to that switch the relevant configuration needed to enable uh, the corresponding service. So next slide. So, so here, yes, yeah, this is the network you're talking about, uh, possibly in a data center, where we have a controller set of servers. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, when the PE device or the access P and VE device receives the first sign of life coming from server, is going to encode into an EVPN and LRI. Uh, an Ethernet segment identifier is going to encode the IP and MAC uh, information uh, that it received or did discover uh, by whatever uh, mechanisms uh, uh, on the access. And then it will send that uh, EVPN and LRI in the default world to the controller who is importing those routes. And the controller, in return, is going to check whether a service needs to be provisioned down to that switch or the set of switches on the network to enable that service. So, uh, so this is basically the idea. So the first sign of life here is going to be the trigger to uh, set up the EVPN and LRI in a default uh, EVI, for example, in, a, in the default EVI site. And now the controller can push down specific EVI, specific layer two service associated with that first sign of life to uh, the switches uh, in uh, that network. So yeah, the, the draft is proposing a new uh, ESI uh, uh, segment identifier encoding uh, in which we have, uh, we, are, we are gonna have a, a, a new type and in there, we are going to encode uh, an Ethernet port number. That's uh, going to be uh, a common uh, identifier for uh, the port associated to the given switch. Uh, and uh, as well, up to two tags uh, into the same uh, Ethernet segment identifier 10 bytes. And, uh, and, and that uh, what will be encoded in the packet sent to the control. Or the, sorry, the, yeah, the NLRI sent to the control. Next slide. Yeah, I think that's about it, so yeah. That's quick. Jorge Rabadan, Nokia. Um, two questions, so the first one, um, uh, the first sign of life, uh, what exactly uh, that is? Is it a GARP, is it a DHCP? Is it, uh, it could be a yeah, GARP, could be DHCP. Okay, so it's nothing, it's not OAM or anything, it's whatever. Uh, whatever EVPN used today to uh, glean information sent on the NLRI, right? Okay, because you, you were talking about learning the MAC and the IP, and that is not necessarily true. Uh, if you get a GARF, you can get the MAC and the IP, but in a, any other case, you might get only the MAC, right? Uh, correct. Okay. Uh, when, when the EVPN allow you to encode MAC, IP, or sure. whatever is available, right? Okay, got it. The second thing, um, you are defining a new type of uh, ESI. Correct. 
uh, I would the, uh, the moment in 7432 there are five times if I remember five correctly times, yeah. uh, I would define a different type uh, yeah of course to avoid so, collisions yeah. okay this is what we are saying we are proposing a new type I didn't see it in the draft so oh, really okay so we'll update it. it would be nice to have a specific uh, type number already I think there. we were asking okay I'll check that out okay cool thank, thank you thank you so my comment is that, uh, well, it's typically a service provisioning issue that you're addressing. Uh, there are different mechanisms that can be considered to, uh, to trigger the provisioning of a service on a, on a device, including uh, mechanisms triggered by the device itself. So this is one option among many others so that could be a, a radius, diameter, or possibly net cost notification, maybe. Uh, so it would be interesting to have a comparison between the different approaches and why you think that uh, uh, putting this service provisioning stuff in the control plane is um, a better idea. Yeah, sure, we definitely can provide the comparison, but the idea here is that you don't need to run all those control plane. You have only one control plane running on the switch. But we can definitely do the comparison you suggested. Yeah, yeah, but typically uh, it's a trigger to uh, indicate that something has to be configured on the device, so you, you will need something else anyway to do the configuration. Correct, on the but device. you have to use the radius, as you said, or the other protocol. Well, right? yeah, I know. I'm thinking about netconf maybe. So using doing the same thing in netconf would have, uh, well, the same or, or protocol yeah. for both the notification and the configuration. That Actually, would make sense as well. We are not saying netconf will not uh, can will not be used here. No, no, no. What, what I'm yeah. saying is having one tool to do the, to do both sides both. Oh, you mean using Both the trigger and the configuration would make sense. Okay, sure. We'll do the comparison and uh, put why uh, we think EVPN is a good idea here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Patel Cisco. So I echo. Um, I do agree with uh, Thomas's uh, comments. Um, since you're doing this for one service, there are multiple other services, and I'm presuming you're wanting to use BGP, which I. Agree. Uh, actually, here we are using EVPN, right? So yeah. it's already BGP uh, uh, carry, right? That's so why I said we're not BGP. proposing a new thing, right? Yeah, yeah. That's why I said, and I agree with that. But there are common mechanisms inside BGP also being defined um, to do the service announcements within BGP for multiple SAFIs. I encourage you to take a look at it and maybe come up with some sort of reasoning as to why this is better than that. Sure, and, yeah. and comments to chairs. This is yet another reason why. This should be cross-checked with the IDR working group. Sorry about that. OK, thank you. Next time. So we, we take good note of the, uh, of the fact that this, this has to be coordinated with IDR. Um, just to have a feeling, who has read this document? Thank you. Um, next, next speaker is you again. Yeah. Okay. So, so this draft uh, is uh, the service edge gateway draft. So, this draft, uh, what we are proposing here, uh, is be, uh, being able at a service node to dynamically. Um, Terminate, terminate, sorry, uh, an EVPN, BPWS service to uh, a layer three or a layer two service, like another EVPN service. So, so, so what we are talking here is that we have EVPN, BPWS sets up a virtual war. And uh, the idea here is that uh, that setup typically is between uh, two P's, uh, you know, uh, the two P's here will be the access P and the service P. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is that we want the access P to tell uh, 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 the service P uh, that I want that war to terminate to a layer two or a layer three uh, verb. Yeah, next slide. So, so, so this is a typical network here uh, in which in the access uh, we have uh, the EVPN VPWS service being signaled. Uh, between the access and the service node. And uh, uh, then from the service, uh, uh, this war, as uh, the service node takes that war and put it into, um, sorry, can you go back? 
Okay, no problem. So, so, so uh, now on the service, that war is going to be put into uh, the layer two and the layer three uh, uh, service requested uh, uh, by the access node. So, 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 so here you can think about it as if we are signaling uh, the war, which is the VPWS service, and signaling that war should terminate on what layer two or layer three service on the service node. So signaling the war and the service that that war should be associated with. Yeah, next slide. Okay. So uh, the way you will do that is by first uh, service P discovering each other, right? So service P goes and try to discover what are the service P that exist in that network. So uh, service P exchange what we call uh, EVPN, uh, sorry, exchange the EVPN Ethernet AD route, uh, and in there uh, they are exchanging uh, along those EVPN AD route uh, the overlay services that they they can terminate virtual war to. As a service node, when uh, they exchange those routes, Those route, yes, as shown here, uh, the Ethernet tag is put as wildcard. Uh, the label uh, has zero value, and they are exchanging uh, the Ethernet AD route one pair overlay service, whether it's layer two or layer three overlay service. Uh, and uh, there is another RT associated with that route to limit uh, uh, that route exchange to uh, the service nodes only, we call that the layer 2 VPN RT, limiting it to only the service node uh, in the network. Next slide. Please. Uh, so, so, so now, uh, on the access PE, we go provision uh, the access, uh, the ACID of the access uh, port, and we provision uh, as well uh, that access port should be part of what overlay service. Okay? Uh, now the access node would advertise an Ethernet AD route uh, to uh, change that physical war to a virtual war, and, uh, <clears throat> and that war, uh, that, that Ethernet AD route will be uh, advertising the network, right? Okay, next slide. Uh, so uh, here the service node, um, one thing to mention is that we have to pick now one of the service node uh, to, to actually terminate the war. So to tell the access PE, I'm going to terminate the war. And in EVPN, EPWS terminology, that means that the service node has sent back to the access node an Ethernet AD route saying, I'm willing to terminate that war coming from you. So, so prior to that, the service node does the FL action. Uh, and figure out which one is going to be the primary service node to terminate the war, and which one will be the backup. Next slide. So uh, here, the service PE, after deciding who is active and who is the backup, would advertise back to the access node an Ethernet AD route, saying, I am going to be the primary, or I'm going to be the backup to terminate your war and I'm going to offer for you the overlay service you requested in your request. So, so one benefit here is that we are doing only single-sided signaling, right? Meaning that we only provision the service on the axis where, where, where it's meaningful, and we don't provision the service on the service node. Service node dynamically terminates the R into the overlay service without needing to be provisioned with uh, the R itself or uh, that war terminate what service. Okay, so yeah, when the service node respond back, it uses the same service instance ID uh, uh, that the access node did signal for the war, right? So, so the access node knows, okay, hey, this is the war they are terminating, and uh, now uh, traffic is gonna flow from uh, the customer edge over, uh, the physical war via the access P over the virtual war arrive to the service node, and voila, from there, we offer uh, as a layer two 
our layer three overlay server. Okay, so 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 is this summarize the benefits? Uh, you know, mainly uh, it's definitely a scalable mechanism. You don't need to provision single site provisioning. You only provision uh, the service where it matters, uh, and uh, we you know the. Uh, that service can be extended to any service node, whatever, right? Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's as well, uh, auto discovery mechanism is there, right? Because the service node can discover uh, the access uh, uh, node, uh, and of course discover other service nodes in the network. And it's uh, kind of automatically as well provisioning. Uh, and uh, again, uh, functionality at the head end can include QoS can include filtering and so on, uh, and this could be requested again from uh, the access node. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so yeah, we are presenting for the first time, even though it's version two, uh, but uh, we are seeking comments. Yeah, please go ahead. Jorge Rabadán, Nokia. Yeah, well, I sent you a bunch of comments, uh, but I think you must might have missed them. Um, I'll follow up with you. Yeah, sure, please. But, uh, I, I think I responded to some of your comments before, no? Some of them, yes, but uh, you didn't make any, any changes, even though okay. some of them you said you would. But, okay. Uh, we, we can follow uh, up. Sure, time. yeah, I, I think yeah, we were in a rush to refresh before I hear, but uh, sure, we'll, we can have another version. I recall, yes, the comments. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it has yeah. been some time. No worries, uh, we'll follow up offline. One of the things that, to me, is still extremely confusing is the multi-homing on the service nodes. You talk about the election based on the HRW thing, mm -hmm. but you don't say how, do you, how you define the Ethernet segments, how you exchange the, uh, the ES routes. Um, it's not oh, there, sure. basically. So. Sure, yeah, you, you, mean, you mean from the service node, how are we advertising Ethernet AD route for the services, and how are we? Uh, and the ES route as, as well. Uh, right? Correct. Yeah. And if you are changing any uh, any of the basics, um, it has to be explicitly. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I, I don't think you are changing. You are right. The draft uh, need some updates as well, even to reflect some of the stuff in the slides. So we are working on updating it. But as well, we'll consider your comments or hey, if you send. Again, yeah, please. I'll follow up you to, with you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey Zhang from Juniper. Um, the per EVI AD routes carries the two out route targets. Mm -hmm. uh, can you clarify the, the usage of the second one that is corresponding to the service that it, it is? I think I think you are talking about uh, the AD route. The AD route that carries the two route target is yeah. between the service nodes. Right. So so one route target is limiting that route to right. only the service nodes. So, so, so the access node won't get to know them, so, so right. we can do the DF election. The other RT is talking about the overlay service that that virtual war will terminate. So, so, so we have the, the virtual war coming from the access, want to terminate to an overlay service, so this is the other RT. Is that second route target used to uh, use for route import purpose or? For route, sorry? For route import purpose. Uh, route import? Right. Because my understanding of the route target is uh, so to control with how, whether a P imports the route or not. Ah, uh, correct. So the second route, route target is also in, using that for that purpose? The second route target here is not using for import, uh, uh, you know, into the EVP. If you are talking about the uh, EVI table, the first route target is what imported to the EVI table again at the service node, right? Right. The second RT uh, is what that war should terminate to. So it's not really imported to that RT. Uh, it's the war terminating to that overlay RT service, right? Uh, that will, you know, it's only a war, right? So, so it's not really a route, right. but the route itself is terminated or the EVI uh, the EVI table for BPWS service imports that route, you are right, based uh -huh. on the first route target. Okay, um, I guess I, I need to follow up uh, with you for, uh, offline because I'm, sure, I'm yeah. still a little bit confused. Um, either way, that the draft could uh, uh, elaborate that a little bit. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. As yeah. I mentioned, we, we still are working on updating it. Yeah. Uh, second question, can you go back to the benefits slide? OK. Benefits, yeah. The auto-provisioning part, can you elaborate on that? How do you auto-provision the? We talked cost? about single-sided provisioning. So, so the idea here is that uh, we are not provisioning the service at the axis and at the service key. We are only provisioning the service at the axis, where it matters. So there is no provisioning done at the service key. So, so you can imagine as if the service PE is doing auto-provisioning, right? Because when he terminates the war, he knows that that war should terminate to that verb. So instead of you typing uh, interface X or interface war, terminate to verb foo, uh, you don't need to, co to configure that on the service PE, you auto-provision that. So um, that's the service uh, PE. A auto, uh, pro, uh, actually a provision those, for example, the bandwidth uh, stuff on, on, on uh, yeah, the service. Yeah, uh, what we said here is that this as well, uh, those, the bandwidth and the other stuff, can be uh, uh, against signal Sorry. from the access P. So it's done on the access P, the service P does not do that at all. The service P, yes, no provisioning as the service P. But yeah, is, there, right. is there enforcement at the... Um, Per, on the per, per wire level. What do you mean by enforcement? Sorry. So we don't we don't have time. We are completely okay. out of time. So Sorry, let's, no, no. Uh, let's yeah, take offline. Yeah. Offline. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Take it on the list. So I think it's uh, valuable, valuable yeah. for many people. Yes, yeah, the, the discussion is definitely useful. We're sorry to be short on time. When it's your turn now. So I'm going to talk about uh, inter-subnet forwarding for multicast traffic for eVPN. And um, one biggest three gateway is everywhere on each PE, in the, which means distributed gateway, when the gateway function is distributed on all the eVPN PEs. So first, take one step back. Let's uh, look at how inter-subnet traffic is delivered for non-unicast traffic. So I have uh, in the diagram here, we have uh, three PE, P1, P2, and a P3. And each PE has uh, two bridge domain. The blue bridge domain is uh, bridge domain one corresponding to uh, subnet one or blue subnet. Second bridge domain, the green bridge domain, is uh, corresponding to subnet two or the green subnet. So we have a C. Oh, okay. Before we go, to that each P has a integrated bridge and a routing interface. The IRB interface provide a layer three gateway function on each P. So it's a distributed IRB approach. So when the C want to deliver traffic to C1 want to deliver traffic to C2 or C6 in different subnet. Uh, it always was sent to the IRB interface on its local bridge domain, which is the blue bridge domain. And no matter where the destination PE is, whether it's local to its own PE or it's on the remote PE3, traffic will always layer three routed locally on the PE1 through the IRB interface. And then also through the IRB interface to the destination bridge, which is the blue green bridge, and then forward it to um, C2 or C6 and in layer two through EVPN. Next, please. So now let's look at in the same setup. What happened to interstate net traffic delivering for multicast traffic for EVPN? So in this picture, I, uh, we assume there's a multicast source attached to the blue bridge domain and now uh, we have receiver everywhere um, to belong to two different bridge domains. The blue, basically the blue subnet and the green subnet. So what happened is uh, multicast traffic on the source subnet, which is the blue subnet, multicast traffic will be delivered based on the EVPN bound procedure and send, then send it to the receiver. It delivers through the core. 
and to the another subnet, the receiver subnet, the green subnet. So it follows uh, layer three procedure. The regular PIM procedure will be routed on the layer three because it's the PIM DR, this uh, IRV on subnet two. So it will be routed on the green subnet to the green subnet on the P3. And then following the EPM bound procedure, uh, flood it across the core and then send it to the receiver in the green subnet. So we see there's some efficiency in this kind of a delivery for inter subnet, multicast inter subnet tra traffic forwarding. We talk about like unicast when we have a local IRB, traffic was always layer three routed locally, no matter whether the, the destination CE is on the same P or different P, it's always routed locally. Here you will see on P2, they will receive multiple copy of same multicast form, one per bridge domain. So basically for the same multicast traffic, it is flooded per bridge domain instead of just deliver once to the core. So this is the one efficiency. And secondly, if you look at the receiver on P1, this uh, P1 will not receive the traffic from the source, which is uh, on its local P attached to its uh, local P1. Instead, receiver one will have to receive the multicast traffic from P3. So here pinning situation happen for, for inter-subnet multicast traffic. Next, please. So, next we will talk about solution to address the hairpinning situation and the multiple copies of uh, same multicast traffic delivered to the core, or delivered or receiving from the core. So, the first thing so we, we are saying, like, uh, just like a uh, non unicast traffic for inter subnet traffic, for multicast traffic, we will also and layer three routed locally to the IRB, as long as there is a receiver. So they were layer three routed through the IRB onto the other sub subnet. Regardless this uh, P, the, the gateway is the PIMDR or not. So receiver one will receive the traffic locally from a P, P1 instead of a, have a hairpinning received from P3. Secondary, for, for IRB interface, whenever there's a receiver on the subnet, the IRB will send a pin join to the SR, uh, to the RP or the source for that subnet, regardless whether it is a pin DR or not. Lastly, for traffic received on the non-source subnet, it follows layer three procedure when they receive the traffic out of the IRB interface, um, it should uh, forward it to its uh, local receiver on the access, but it sh should not forward back, send it back to the core. So this guarantee, there's uh, one copy of traffic. The, for the same multicast flow, only one copy of multicast traffic sent across the core. You won't get a duplication. Next, please. So what happened to multi homing case? So if we follow the p procedure, it should also work. Basically, here we have an example, receiver two and receiver three are multi-home to both P2 and P3, but to in different bridge domain, which is a blue one and um, green one respectively. And the traffic will be, multicast traffic will be flooded in the source subnet, follow the EVPN bound procedures. And once they reach to the P2 and the P3, when delivered to the multi home the CE, it's, uh, it's the same rule as defined in IFC 7432. Basically, only the DF for the multi home the ES will deliver the traffic to the multi home the CE. Next, please. So, conclusion. So, just uh, summarize where we talk about the solution to overcome the inefficiency. So on the source subnet, there's no change. Just follow the basic EVPN bound procedure. On the non-source subnet, it's multicast will be layer three routed locally from the source subnet to the to other receiver receiving subnet. 
And uh, when it's getting to the receiving sub, as a subnet, it should only deliver locally to its uh, receiver on the access side, and they should not forward back to the VPN core. So it addressed the hairpinning situation, like uh, we specified before, like uh, if uh, receiver one is, uh, the, the receiver is on the same subnet and on the, as the source, but um, on that subnet of the receiver resigns, it, the P is not a PIMDR. So it will, in this kind of case, it addressed the hairpinning situation. And also, just a guarantee there's only one copy of the uh, same multicast flow to deliver across, across the sub, subnet. Instead of uh, we need to flood one per bridge domain. Next, please. Uh, so the, the, our next step on the courses, we like to seek comments and uh, feedback from the working group. And uh, other things we are still working in progress is uh, if a PE does not have an IRB or the PE is, does not uh, on the source subnet. So this is still working in progress. So, uh, Eric Nordmark. So does that include the case when you have different sets of bridge domains on the different PEs? Because in your picture, they were all identical. They were both, all of them were blue and, and, and green, right? Yes. Yeah, I so, could have different subsets of them hosted on different PEs. So if, uh, so this is uh, what covers gonna be in the work, still in, in the working progress. So what we have assumed right now, since working well is uh, when we, there's two things. First of all, IRB is distributed. Each PE has IRB. Look, can do layer three um, gateway function. Secondly, each PE is on the source subnet, so it can receive the multicast traffic from the source subnet. If it's not on the source subnet, of course, and um, the rule specifies it will not receive the remote PE will not receive the multicast flow from the source subnet. So we, there is a solution to that, but we're still working in progress. So this, maybe next time we will but, go but, over this. But I think there's another one, which is that if you have, if you have more bridge domains, right, you're not gonna necessarily provision all the bridge domains and the associated IRB interfaces across all the PEs because you don't have any local ports in those bridge domains. I agree, so that's why if uh, you don't have IRB everywhere, this is something we're gonna address working progress right I now. I think more specifically, um, what is Eric is asking is, if the bridge domains are mutually exclusive, the same bridge domain, if uh, one PE has BD10, uh, uh, the other one has BD20, you know. Yes. And then the third one has BD both 10 and 20. So Yeah, uh, we understand, yes. Yeah. So this is a part that is uh, specified in the draft where we're thinking about a special tunnel need to be selective multicast tunnel need to be built. That's, but uh, uh, this is a working in progress. We will so address later. I have later. one basic question. What kind of IRB is this? What kind of IRB you're assuming in here? Because we got the symmetric and asymmetric. IRB, right? In the inter subnet draft that we described, we got symmetric and asymmetric. I have question, frankly, about the flows. This, this is definitely not symmetric. Asymmetric, I'm not sure whether it, <clears throat> with the asymmetric, the bridge domain on the access facing is different than the bridge domain from the core facing. You didn't show the core facing bridge domain. I have uh, questions regarding the uh, flows for this, uh, both unicast and multicast. Maybe we can take Ali, it offline. Yeah. Can, no, can you can you post them on the list? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Can... I think. Uh, and uh, Jeffrey, I'm sorry, I'm cutting the line because yeah. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, basically, they routed a road current. It's not across the EVPN core. So there is a. Symmetric and asymmetric is uh, depend is the way the this, this symmetric and asymmetric is how they send the traffic across the core. Here, it's just follow regular layer three PIM procedure, 
in the layer three. So traffic is surrounded the across tunnel the end summit. Are important where the tunnel endpoints terminate, and that is not clear to me. So yeah, we to can the talk list, offline. To the list, please. Yeah. Sorry. We can uh, talk offline. Fun way. It's your, your turn. Thank you. And you'll have to be very quick. Sorry. You have five minutes instead of. Five. Okay, thank you. So this is the R2 VPN service uh, young data model. So the chair, men chair mentioned it uh, just now. Um, so I'm from, I'm far away from ZTE. Mm. So the motivation is that uh, we will try to define the R2 VPN northbound service. We, here we limit uh, the, uh, the service young data model as the northbound. Uh, service young data model because the uh, young data model were were used between the uh, maybe app or, or, or orchestration and and the controller so we name it as the northbound service so we will use this model as the import in, input for an orchestration layer so the orchestration layer is uh, responsible to translate the application service to orchestrated configuration. Um, here, we, we have this model based on our carrier's requirement. They, they need to have a uniform uh, young data model to translate the uh, uh, APP service into the orchestrated um, configuration. So in, in this document, we define the inan service and the inan. Um, service. So next. So here is the uh, SDM based R2 VPN service uh, finger. Actually, this is the uh, SDM based IP run scenario. So we, we have orchestration and uh, controller. And uh, also, we have uh, two domains um, for the IP run. And the, uh, and the A. A31, A32, and C31, C32 are uh, ASBRs. It will mm -hmm. connect to different uh, domains. So, um, okay, next. I think you have some questions. Okay, and, and there. So very quickly, Adrian Farrell, um, I love the picture. Uh, to clarify, you're defining a Yang model for use on the thing that you have marked northbound interface on this figure, is that correct? Yes, so we will define the young data model um, for the APP or orchestration between the controller. So, uh, the, so the, the young data model may be orchestration um, um, between the orchestration and the controller. We may also be used for APP and the controller. Ah, okay. It's a floor wax and a dessert topping. Um, I think you need to decide which you are focusing on because I don't believe they are the same data model. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, this is the structure for um, for the service uh, model. Model. So we have Inan and and Inan um, service. Um, um, we have uh, several on. Um, Several container for for the two service, one is PWNIST and AC service policy and tunnel policy. For the PWNIST, for the PWNIST, this is optional because if the if the uh, next next slide will describe this in detail. Okay. Uh, 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 next. Uh, yeah, yeah. This this is the PW list. So if we we will we will establish the R2 VPN service uh, on inter for the inter domains, we will have this PW list because the user may want to know which one is the uh, ASBR for the domain. Um, please go go. To, uh, okay. So you you will have you you will have to wrap up now. Conclude. Uh, okay. So so um, the so others are the de 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 details I would note and the node may may be discussed later. Okay. 
the next uh, step. So this is the this is the initial um, version for the service young um, data model. So um, we ask for comments, and uh, we will also uh, try to improve this draft uh, based on our product Im implement implementation. Okay. So question. Um, so the we kept this. Um, this uh, this document on the agenda because uh, uh, it was useful to to discuss one uh, data point that would be interesting to have is maybe adrian you will be able to answer is uh, whether or not uh, uh, a data service model is uh, uh, considered for being in a in a recharter of l3sm or something else or uh, adrian farrell it is not proposed by the chairs to recharter L3SM to take on thing, anything else. Of course, the ITF is the ITF, so people can bring ideas and attempt to persuade the area director. My belief is he would not recharter L3SM. So if L2SM work wanted to be done, it could be taken to the ops area as a new piece of work, or um, Certainly negotiated between area directors where it went. So, so do we have L two SM later, or do we have just uh, try to create this work group? So, so the conclusion is that the place where this work would be hosted is uh, unknown yet. Right. Uh, I would recommend talking to area directors. Um, so, talk to Alvaro for this working group. Talk to Benoit Clays for ops to work out where to do this work. Um, if you go to Benoit, I am pretty certain he will say, I only want operators working on this. Okay, thank you. Um, so don't hesitate to keep uh, pursuing the discussion on the, on the base, on the base mailing, mailing list uh, in the meantime, okay. uh, in parallel with discussion you can have with IDs. So, so if if the R two SM work group has not been formed, so can we discuss it in this in in, in best group? You can definitely discuss on the list, okay. and then whatever is present in next meeting is unknown yet. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Uh, thank you for attending best. We are sorry for the uh, for Ali because uh, we we don't have time for your draft. Yeah. We, yeah, we apologize, Ali. We apologize, well, actually, to everyone for not having managed the time as, uh, as, uh, as well as we could have. Thank you, everyone. Mm-hmm.